Well, good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Apparently, yeah, amen. Apparently, it was snowing during Sunday school. I tell you, that's just horrible. <laughs> um, I want to remind everybody, that, or my leaders, that we got our meeting after service today, so make sure that you uh, stay back there. Um, also, remember, next week is our business meeting. Make sure you're making plans to attend. Um, even if you're not a voting member, make sure you're making plans to attend, okay? Because this is good to understand where our church is, where, where we're going this year, how we're going forward, um, and to understand, because we got to present our books and just that yearly process of things that we have to let you know where we are. It's a, it's a meeting for full transparency between y'all, all right, so that you understand where things are going. Um, so we have a fellowship meal immediately following service next week. Make sure that you sign up on the, um, on the meal uh, paper out, out on the welcome table. I couldn't think of it. Um, there's also some spots that if you want to help set up and clean up and all that, make sure you put your names in there. There is a sheet out on the welcome table. It's got a bunch of squares with the months labeled out on it. What we have started is a cleaning schedule for this church so that it doesn't fall on Katie and I all the time. Um, so if you would like to sign up for one of those months, the first three months are covered, but if you are willing to serve and clean the church for a month and you can dedicate to a month, we'll give you the list of what needs to be done and how everything you know, goes, but sign up. Help us take care of this house. Can we do that? So, well, I got one that believes it. <laughs> um, let me think. Uh, reminder that women's Bible study is starting tomorrow at 6 o'clock, right? Okay, so make sure, women, that you come to the Bible study. It's going to be an amazing time. I think y'all need this just as much as the men do. We're just waiting for God to raise up a, guy, a man to do it because I don't want to take on another thing. <laughs> I don't want to take on another thing. So... Um, make sure, women, 6 o'clock tomorrow here at the church. In the sanctuary? Yes, in the sanctuary, 6 o'clock, okay? Also, remember that Embrace Grace is starting back up next Monday, the 16th, all right? So if you are involved in Embrace Grace, make sure that you meet those, that you're here for those meetings at 6 o'clock. I'm trying to think of everything else we need to do. Katie, can you think of anything else? I don't think so. I think I'm good. Ed, we good? Oh, yes, next, uh, next week is BGMC. Thank you. Huh? No, next week. This is the second week, so next week. So, <laughs> uh, we're already in the second week of January, folks. Um, but BGMC is next week. This is where we gather up all of our change and our folding money, and we send it away to our missionaries, to help them in the field. By the way, folks, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and, and your faith promises that God has laid on your heart. Because, folks, because of your faith promises, I want to tell you what, what God has done through you. I just want to give you all the props. Because, because of your faith promise and what God has laid on your heart to give every month to missions, we have been able to add... Well, let me rephrase that. We've been able to increase... Two of the missionaries uh, monthly giving from this church that we've been supporting for a long time. Not only that, wait, there's more. Um, we were able to bring on three additional missionaries at that same rate. <laughs> Folks, we have been able to, we, because of your faith promises, we have been able to promise to give our missionaries, these five, $63 a month. So five missionaries, it's $315 a month. Just to tell you how big of a deal that was, we have increased from what we were giving, which is $105 a month, to $315. That's how God works, folks, and that's what your faithfulness to faith promise does. 
is that we are able to take what you believe, what you're believing God to provide for you, even though it doesn't match up with that bottom line, you're believing God for that monthly amount. So thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for your faithfulness in your giving, in your tithes, and being obedient to what God has commanded us to do in our giving. Thank you. Because of that, we were able to keep the lights on. We've been able to do updates. We're, we're beginning the updates for this year, just things that ha we are having to fix. It's because of your faithfulness, folks. Lord, uh, uh, The Lord has been gracious to us all. And just so you know, we took up that special offering, just so you know what's coming throughout the year. We took up that special offering, and a few times throughout the year, we're going to take up that a special offering We've already, we've already taken care of the family, folks. The church, God has given us the ability to already take care of the family. Thank you, Jesus. But along with that, now we're asking for your faithfulness to not necessarily replenish, but that's the only word I can think of, replenish that benevolence fund. Okay? We have a fund set up in this church to help families in need. That's what, that's what these special offerings will go to, is that benevolence fund. That's what the church is supposed to do, folks. We're supposed to take care of those in need. So I, as, as we do that periodically throughout the year, I'll mention it you know, a few times throughout the year, and then we'll have them. So um, thank you. Just thank you for everything that you're allowing God to do through you, financially, spiritually, uh, you know, numerically, everything. Thank you for your obedience to God. Um, I think that's it. Are you ready to worship? All right. We're going to begin in our worship and our giving. And give, worship is that act of submission unto God. And giving is just as much an act of submission as everything else. Everything I just mentioned to you is because of your faithfulness and your giving. So, Brother Eric, Brother Jacob, you want to come? It was. It was last Thursday. We got him on Thursday night. We sung to him on Thursday night <laughs> because we missed him last week. <laughs> yeah, Jacob. <laughs> Father, we come before you right now and we thank you. Thank you, God, for the, the finances that you've given us, the ability that we can bless you in a tangible way. Father, we thank you that you are leading and directing in every way. And Lord, we just give this day to you. We give this service to you. Holy Spirit, rain down on us and do what you will. In our hearts, in our minds, mold us in how you want us to go forward, God. We just give it, give it all to you. In Jesus' name, we thank you and ask this. Amen. Brother Tony, our worship leader, is going to lead us into the presence of the Lord this morning. Lehan, if I knew you were coming today, we wouldn't sung to you Thursday. Well, <laughs> uh, you are you ready? You're going to get stuck. All right. So if you'd like to stand and we'll uh, begin to praise and worship our Lord and Savior. Yeah. <laughs> Looking to see if I see any new faces. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, 
Water for my thirsty soul, I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness, like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water on my to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness like free Sound of a symphony right here. Like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. The only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. The only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. The only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my like holy water, your forgiveness, like sweet, honey on my lips, like the sound of a symphony to my ears, like holy water on my skin, like holy
to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin I 
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop.
bad. We just thank you, Lord God, for always being there. God, Lord, it's by your power, not by ours, but Lord, by your spirit, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we just give John to you right now, God, and we speak the power into him, oh God, the blessing, oh God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Lehan, don't you go nowhere. Come here, Lehan. Come here, Lehan. Oh, guys, it's another one. I'm going to lose my voice. I'm going to need God to carry me through this. One of these days, I'm going to learn this. That's all right. We're going to pray for this young man. So when my prayer warriors come up, he's going to stand in for his grandpa. He's going to stand in for his grandpa. Come here. Stand here. And we're going to believe. Look at me. <laughs> we're, we're going to believe God for healing on his grandpa right now. His grandpa's had another heart attack. He's sitting at the hospital. And I believe that God can heal and God will heal. And I am declaring that God is healing in this moment as we are here. The Holy Spirit is live and well. And He is moving in this place right now. Father, we just ask and we lift our brother up to you right now. Father, as he stands in for his grandpa. Father, in many ways, Lord, you need to touch his body. You need to touch his heart. You need to touch his mind. Father, I just pray for healing, and I believe that his heart is healed. We declare that. Lord, we've heard testimonies where you've taken metal out of people's body. We've heard testimonies where you've given people arches in their feet. We've heard testimonies to where you've remade hearts. And God, we're asking right now that you would remake the heart of Tom in more ways than one. Lord, that you would bring him to you. Lord, use this, God, to bring him into salvation with you. Father, we thank you. We praise you. And Holy Spirit, we just declare this right now and saying that we know it is done. In Jesus' name, it's over. Hallelujah. 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 You're next. You are next. Gary, you're next too. Can you make it up here? Come on. Connie, we're going to pray for you. We're going we're, we're gonna to be praying and we're going to be believing God. These people need a touch from God. And I'm not going to stop God and what he wants to do. We're going to pray for these people. We're going to believe God's healing on these. Tony's facing another heart surgery. But God, we know that God can clean out those arteries. We know that God can fix things. That yes, he uses doctors and, and, and nurses, certainly. But he is, he is going to work. Father, we come before you and we lift our brother up to you right now. Father, we know the things that he faces. Lord, you know the trials that are before him. Father, we ask that you would move mightily in Tony's heart right now. Father, I pray healing on his heart. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would pulsate and move and bring healing and open these valves, open these arteries. Lord, clean them out just as you are the only one who can. They have all this medicine. They have all this stuff. And Lord, I know that it works. But Lord, we come to the great physician, the one who made his heart in the first place. I come to the greatest cardiologist in the world. And he, I know that you are going to bring healing healing on our brother as we speak this word into his heart right now in Jesus name it's over we pray hallelujah hallelujah Gary so we can well I'm going to bring Gary up because his knees <clears throat> father we bring our brother to you right now Lord we know what brother Gary's facing and we know the anxiousness that whirls around in his heart. Father, we just pray that you would bring peace to his heart. That you would bring understanding and, and knowledge and wisdom that only you can bring. Father, we're speaking healing on our brother right now. Father, as you did with Cornel or with that centurion, Lord. Where he came and he said, I, I'm not worthy for you to enter my house, but just speak a word. Well, Lord, we're standing in your house right now. And we're asking that you bring healing on our brother and that you would move in his heart, move in his life, remove this tumor off his kidneys so there will be nothing for them to remove. 
that they will not have to remove the kidney. He won't have to go through his surgery. Lord, let him in this consultation that's coming up on the 20th, look at him and say, we made a mistake. There is no tumor. And we declare that right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, sister. Come on. Oh, folks. The Holy Spirit's moving. And I'm not going to stop him. <laughs> Father, we come before you for our sister right now. Lord, we ask. She's facing a mountain, God. She's facing a mountain called needing to gain weight. And Lord, we declare right now that we believe that you are going to work on her body, that she is going to begin to gain weight without any problem. Lord, we know that the doctors want to add a feeding tube, but Lord, we also know that we serve the risen Savior, the same Spirit that raised you from the dead works in us. And you are the one who brings the healing. And we declare the healing right now. Lord, we believe that everything she eats, that you will bring nourishment to her body, that you will bring weight to her body, and Lord, that you will help her, that she will not have to have this feeding tube. Lord, we also speak to this, to this trait that she has. Father, we're praying and believing that that will seal shut. Lord, we know that you have this power. We know you have this ability. We believe. Help our unbelief, God. In Jesus' name, I speak this into my sister's life. Lord, give her an understanding of your word like nobody has ever seen before. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. 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 Oh. Mm. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. I think we're good. I think we're good. Oh, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, give me my voice, God. Give me my voice. Oh, give me my voice, God. <clears throat> Folks, let it never be said, I'm a docile preacher. <laughs> Oh, one thing that you've all always heard me say, we're going to be in John, it's where we're going to start today. So if you want to turn, it give you a second to get there. It's going to be John 1 is where we're going to start. <clears throat> But you've heard me say that perception is real to the eye of the perceiver. You've heard me say this before, I'm sure, because I say it all the time. But this is a statement that holds true to every day of our lives so much. This is a statement that holds true. How we look at things and how we respond to things is what directs our lives and our perspectives as well as our own perceptions. As we begin our journey through this year of spiritual maturity, God is wanting to change our perspectives and our perceptions. The difference, one you view with your senses, the other, it's a point of view that you look at. Okay? You know, he wants to change our perceptions. But in other words, God is going to be challenging us to look at things in a different way. He's going to be challenging us to look at things in a different way. He's going to be challenging our perspectives and our perceptions. So that, that the way that we view the world is the way that he views the world. See, that's how it's supposed to work. We're not supposed to view the world from our eyes. We're supposed to view the world from his eyes. And I believe that in this way, God is leading me, that, that he is laying on my heart that we are going to begin a series titled Biblical World View. Now I want you to think about that statement while I talk. This is a very hard thing for me because as I was preparing for this series, I did some looking and digging. 
as I tend to do. But part of the reason it's difficult for me is because of the information that I found. The information that I found, Barna Research Group, they're a big group that does a lot of research. All right? They did a couple studies. And what I found in these studies floored me. They floored me. Because it's exactly where the world is today. You know, they were exactly where the world is today. One of the studies said that 6% of Americans are holding a biblical worldview. Did you hear what I said? 6% of Americans are holding a biblical worldview. Oh, let me get even better. Another, one said, another study said 17%. 17% of Christians are holding a biblical worldview. 17% of Christians. But the one that really floored me was this one. It said it this way. Um, more than 60% over half of born again Christians between 18 and 39. Big age gap. Yes. Between 18 and 39 believe, Christians between 18 and 39 believe that Jesus. Buddha and Muhammad are all equal in regard to the path of salvation. Christians believe, 60% believe that there are other ways to heaven than Jesus. The probe survey shows that even born again Christians can have a false view of Jesus Christ and embrace a pluralistic worldview. That means multiple gods. Christians, folks. I mean, the question is, fine. Pastor, these are all statistics. Great. How do you know what a biblical worldview is? I'm glad you asked. Because the marks that they used during this research was that a biblical worldview means this. That you believe that absolute moral truth exists. That was the first mark they used. The Bible is totally accurate in all its principles that it teaches. That's number two. Number three is Satan is considered to be a real being or force, not merely symbolic. That's number three. A person can't earn their way to heaven by trying to be good or do good works. That's number four. And Jesus lives, lived a sinless life on earth, and God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today. Those are the questions that when they did this study, I mean, 6% of Americans agreed with this. 17% of Christians held this viewpoint. Folks, I don't know about you, but it's safe to say that our perspectives and our perceptions are a little bit off in the world. If two of these, it's two of these points that I believe that God wants us to tackle today, and that is that the absolute moral truth exists as well as the Bible is totally accurate in all its principles that it teaches. In other words, God's word is a truth that stands strong. One of the biggest questions that we as Christians must tackle that I'm sure that every one of us has dealt with is that, you know, how can we know that the Bible is true? After all, the Bible was written by man, don't you know? Therefore, it can't be trusted. Wait a minute. 
How many of you ever heard this before? How many of you ever heard this from people? Well, the Bible was written by man, so therefore it can't be trusted. Well, I'll tell you what. I saw something the other day, and it rang really true to this statement. It was a meme that simply said, if the Bible was written by man, why does it go against everything that man says is okay? Think about that statement. If the Bible was truly written by man, how come it goes against everything that man says is okay? Mm. I'll tell you what. The truth is, if we are truly going to have a biblical worldview in our life, it has to start here. It has to start understanding that the Bible is the divinely inspired and inerrant word of God himself. So if you're taking notes, that's the first point and pretty much the whole point of what we're going today. But the Bible is divinely inspired. Throughout the Old Testament, you hear from God's prophets, the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, this is what the Lord says. The Lord gave me a message. Think about these for a moment. Now think about one specifically. The word of the Lord came to me. John 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to go through verse 2, verse 5. In the beginning, the world already existed. Or the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when it said that the Word of the Lord came to me, it was through the divine direction of the Holy Spirit that these prophets spoke. Not only did they speak in several places of God's word, it says that the Lord said, write this down. Write this down. Go all the way to Revelations chapter 1, verse 11. It said, Revelations chapter 1, verse 11, it said, Write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the city of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. How many of you heard that the Bible was written by a game of telephone? You ever heard that? This was not a game of telephone to where one person told another and another and another. And so for therefore, at the beings that happened, it deteriorated over time. People say that, folks. They say that because it was written in the fashion that it was, oh, we can't trust it. Folks, you don't hear these things out in your world. I've heard them my whole life. This was God speaking to his very creation through the direction of the Holy Spirit to give us his word. And why? So that we knew what to do. So that we knew how to go forward. So that we had direction. Go to 2 Peter, <clears throat> verse 116, or chapter 1, verse 16, excuse me. I'll give you a second to get there. Oh, Lord, thank you. Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. 
When he received honor and glory from the God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they say. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they, speak from, uh, they spoke from God. It says that you must realize that no prophecy... in Scripture, came from the prophet's own understanding. Peter was testifying of the very origin of Scripture as well as the prophecies that came from God himself, not mankind. I mean, this shows us that God's message is infallible. You know what that means? In other words, God's word is incapable of mistakes or failure. It's never wrong. It's completely true and effective in its teachings. That also means that it's inerrant, meaning that it is free from error and, and falsehood and deceit. These are two things that walk hand in hand. Scripture is without error. Because of the infallibility of God himself. And in his, in his own word. Isaiah 55. Verse 10 through 11. The rain and the snow. Come down from the heavens. And stay on the ground to water the earth. They, cause, uh, they cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out to you or out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere that I send it. Or everywhere I send it. God's word is true, folks. God's word is true, and it comes from the very mouth of God, and it will accomplish its purpose that God spoke it for. God has given us the very instruction manual for our lives. There is nothing that we will face in the world that God won't use his word to lead us through. Nothing. Everything that we have, he has given to uh, given us to teach us and correct us. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and, I, and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out, touched my mouth, and said, Look, I have put my mouth, or my words, in your mouth. God's word is true. It's the very word from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to declare it before man. Well, pastor, I mean, what about the people I encounter? What if they disagree with me? What if, they, what, if they, what if I offend them? Don't be afraid to claim the word of God before man. Don't make me say it again. Because if you are truly wanting to walk with God and standing on the very word of God because God's word you're going to offend some people do you know why because God's word is rightly offensive 
I don't set out to offend people, but when I give them the word of God, it offends them. Why? Because <clears throat> what I said in the first sentence of the Bible uh, on Thursday night, I referenced this. The Bible is offensive because it's written in the beginning, the very first sentence of the Bible. For God, or, or excuse me, God created. You know, in the beginning, God created. It's offensive because we stand on the truth and the authority of God's word. When it says God is, he is. And God created everything. People get offended when we stand on those truths. So, when we stand on the inherent or inerrant, infallible word of God, you're going to offend people. You're going to offend people, plain and simple. However, you know what else you're going to do? Some of the people you're going to show the light to. You're going to turn the lights on. You're going to turn the lights on. Because it's, I mean, you're going to show them the light that John 1 referenced. It said the word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to Everyone. Jesus' word, Jesus is the word, and Jesus brought the light. He brought that light. The Bible that we hold in our hands is the very inerrant, infallible word of God. It's the truth that I stand on that, sta that stands strong. It's the very authority, or authority of our lives for those who choose to trust in its truth. I'll tell you what, First Timothy, or excuse me, Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we, are in, when we are wrong. And teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people. To do every good work. Oh, by the way. It said all scripture is God breathed. You hear me say this a lot. You either take all of God's word or you take none of it. You don't get to pick and choose. Oh, you can pick and choose, but you're wrong. Pastor, that's, I, I told you this, world, this year was going to be difficult. Might as well get it started right off the bat. But look, when Paul wrote this second letter to Timothy, there is some indication that there were already some New Testament writings that were already considered divinely inspired. Jesus even taught that Scripture is God's Word, even down to the smallest detail. Matthew 5.18 I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he even confirmed that everything he said came from the mouth of the Father. Oh, and it's all true, by the way. I mean, I really like how one of my commentaries put this. To deny the full inspiration, listen to this, I should have put this on your paper, but I ran out of room. To deny the full inspiration of the Holy Scripture is to set aside the foundational witness of Jesus Christ. Well, wait a minute. Is that an ouch moment? The Holy Spirit and those Christ commissioned to deliver His message as we have it in the Bible. In addition, to ignore the basic fact that the Bible is inerrant is to compromise the God-given authority it has. Oh, by the way, so if you want to question God's word, fine. God's bigger than your questions. Understand that. God's bigger than your questions. But when you come to a point that you say God's word has mistakes, sorry. I'll tell you what, let me try and bring all this together. 
In order for us to truly have a biblical worldview, you have to start here. If you do not believe that God's word is totally inerrant without mistake, and it's his infallible word, we must understand and trust that God's word, the Bible that we hold in our hands today, is the very inerrant, infallible, divinely inspired word of God. Period. That throughout the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, that the prophets, the apostles, and everyone that God chose to use in Scripture spoke and wrote. That's what we have in our hands today. I trust God and I rest on the authority of His Word. That means that I use God's Word to walk through my daily life. And my decisions are made based on God's Word and the direction that I'm supposed to go. I love you folks, but my life is not determined by what you say. My life is determined by what God says. My faith and my hope and trust are in God and His Word. Period. I believe that God's Word is true and that it is truly without error and that it's the very authority of my life in which I stand. The question that I have, what do you believe? Last week, God moved mightily in this place, folks. People rededicated their lives to Christ. And I praise God for that. But what do you believe? I believe that God is poking some today. I truly do. That there are some that struggle in this way. Folks, there is so much. The internet was the most horrible thing ever invented. It really was. Yes, it can be a great tool. But as an overall, what it's been used for is garbage. There, you, you can type in anything and it'll bring you to something that says, well, God's word isn't true. God's word's got mistakes. I'm sorry. Who made you God? Who made them God? I trust what God says. Period. Without question. But I believe that God is trying to poke some people today. Maybe it's the kids. Maybe there are kids here that have not declared Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. Even though you rededicated your life to, to, to the Lord last week, maybe there's still some struggles. Guess what? They're going to be. Rededicating your life to the Lord doesn't mean that everything went away. It means you made a conscious choice to say, God, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Well, guess what? You're still walking through that sanctification process, that, that growing process that he does throughout his, our lives. That progressive process. Folks, I believe that there are some that need to come to these altars. And you need to start moving now. Because I believe that there are people that struggle with God's word and they need to seek him for understanding. That they need to come and they need to ask God to renew your understanding. To renew your thinking. Father, what you've laid on my heart, it's hard, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that in order for us to truly have a biblical worldview, we have to start on belief in your word. We have to believe in your word, Lord. You've given me this objective 
to say that every believer should be able to explain to at least one other person what it means to be living a life without with a or a life with a biblical worldview to be purposefully living a life standing on the truth of God's word what do you believe folks father i know that you are moving in people's hearts god i've said what you've wanted me to say lord and I leave it in your hands. I leave it in your hands. The results are up to you, God. Totally and utterly. Father, I see that in your word time and time again where people should have done something, but the results are up to you, God. The results are up to them. Lord, I pray that as these men and women and children go forward throughout this day and the weeks or the days ahead, should you give us those days. That Lord, I believe wholeheartedly that you will move in their lives. Some will allow you. Some will continue down their path. But God, that doesn't change your love for them. It doesn't change your love for them. And I just pray right now, Lord, that you would just move in their hearts. Lord, move in them. Let them be willing to submit and say, God, I'm a piece of clay and I give myself to you. Mold me and shape me how you want me to be. I submit everything that I am to you, Father. And Lord, I thank you that we have that ability that we can question. Lord, you're not afraid of our questions. And I just ask in those questions when people do, God, that you would reveal yourself to them if they are willing to listen. Because, Lord, that's what you told the disciples when you sent them out. You said if they receive the message, great. But if they don't, shake the dust off, your, shake the dust off their feet. Lord, not everybody's going to listen to our, our words that come from you. Not everybody's going to listen. And, Lord, as much as that breaks our heart, I can't imagine what it does to yours. Father, we need to listen. We need to let you help us grow to that spiritual maturity because we can't do it on our own. Oh sure, we could look at the Bible intellectually, Father, and we could learn all that, but we cannot understand the deep spiritual truths that you are trying to show us. Some of it relies on our faith, Lord, just to say that, Lord, like I did the, the other day when, when you were dealing with me on this message, Father, I put my faith and hope and trust in you and your word that you spoke. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me the instruction manual for our lives. Now help me use it correctly. And I pray that everybody else wants the same. Help us use it correctly, Father. And Lord, have your way in our lives as we go forward. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. I love you guys.